All right. Your public miracle is an overflow of your prayer life. Hallelujah. Someone say amen. All right, listen, I want to go over here. Uh, I want to go over to Isaiah 56. This is incredible. If you're receiving right now, say amen. Listen, there's going to be a lot of, lot of teaching, a lot of revelation here. All right, Isaiah 56, verse 7. Even those I will bring to my holy mountain. Who's God referring to? He's referring to, to Gentiles, to those who have never heard his name, to unbelievers, those who do not have the promise of God over them, those who do not know God, who are separated from God. God is talking about those heathens, those pagans, those Gentiles. God is talking about those people who have never heard about him, who have no connection, no relationship, that are dying in hell. God is, I will bring those people to my holy mountain, and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Woo, Raboska. I'm going to make those heathens joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. That's a big deal. For my house shall be called a, I can't hear you, a house of prayer for all the people. This is so good. Jesus is my house will be a house of prayer for all the nations. Come on, somebody. The greatest job or the greatest um the greatest purpose of you and I being born again is to become a house of prayer. I remember years ago, Lou Engel, I was, I was listening to Lou Engel, uh teaching, and he said, the Muslims, the Muslims have 24, seven houses of prayer. I was in Indonesia, and I heard the mosque at 5 a.m. in the morning. Allah, boy, bismillah, Ramadan, ragma, Allah. And I remember Lou Engel saying, oh, these Buddhist houses of prayer, they pray night and day. These Buddhist, these Hindu, these uh, Islamic Muslim houses of prayer are in the highest tops of the mountains and they're praying to their demonic principalities, to their gods. But where are the Christian houses of prayer that will pray 24 7? Remember, people of God, the witches and the covens are releasing evil prayers. The witches and the covens are releasing witchcraft. The witches and the warlocks and the covens understand. Uh, spiritual connection, spiritual sacrifice, spiritual connectivity. Come on. Who am I talking to today? Spiritists, animists, those people in the dark age, in the dark world, in the dark spirit, they understand dark energy, spiritual energy. So prayer, my gosh, listen, I got to share this story because, you know, I lived in a Muslim country for three years, okay? I lived in a Muslim country for three years ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ in Southeast Asia. I will not reveal right now uh, the place where, but I was ministering, reaching out to many Muslims, okay? And uh, there were uh, two two friends of mine from Indonesia that come to mind. And, um, and uh, I, I stayed over at their home one time. And of course, uh, in the Islamic uh, religion, you need to pray five times a day, five times a day. OK, so whenever they pray, they would kneel down and they would kneel down their certain ways and re repeat, recite these certain prayers. And whenever they prayed, I knelt down beside them and I began to pray in the Holy Ghost. I, I kneeled down beside, and I prayed in the Holy Ghost and they would look and they would say, what are you doing? They would look and say, what are you praying? My prayer life provoked these Muslims to jealousy. My prayer life caused these Muslims to question, what are you praying? To who are you praying to? Does your prayer life provoke Buddhists to jealousy? Does your prayer life have more power than Muslims? Does your prayer life have more power than Buddhists? Come on, somebody. Do you know there's a reason why that the monasteries, the nunneries, the temples, and the Hindu, Buddhist, Islamic religion are on the highest of mountains, high places, principalities. All right, the high places have power. So who am I talking to right now? I'm feeling, my gosh, 
This, there's a war going on in the spirit. And God wants to release prayers from his house, which is a house of prayer. We the people, we are house. Do you know that you are a house of prayer? Which means that wherever you go, whether in Newport Beach and Huntington Beach, California, whether you are in Modesto and Idaho and Arkansas and Australia, wherever you are, you are a house of prayer, which means that you are a house, you are a temple, you are a tabernacle. Tu eres un tabernáculo. Tabernáculo. You are, you are a tabernacle. You are a kema. You are a tent. You are a tent of meeting. You are a tabernacle of prayer. You are a temple of the Holy Ghost. You are a house of prayer. You are a house of prayer. And you carry prayers inside of your spirit. You have prayer requests. You know, it's like this. When, when, you, when, you, when you pray, and I'm going to give some revelation to you, because I see this many times. When you pray, it's like you have a wheel of prayer within you. Wheels within wheels. When you pray, it's like you have realms or wheels. It's like you have wheels of prayer requests and petitions in your spirit. Why do you think the high priest wore an ephod, 12 stones? Because each stone was for intercession for each tribe. When you pray, it's like you, your each prayer that you pray, you wear it like wheels or stones or portions or knickknacks. It's like these things that are a part of compartments, compartmentalized. You're actually carrying prayer. You are a manifestation of prayer. You are an answer to your own prayers. You are an answer to someone else's prayer. You are, do you know, you are an answer to the prayers of God. Jesus prayed for you. Jesus prayed. John 17, which we're going to get into, which is the Jesus you are an answer to Jesus' prayer. Did you know that? You are an answer to the desire of God. God is looking for someone like you to pray his will to be done on earth. God is looking for somebody like you to bring heaven on earth. I have to share this other story. You know, I lived in Tibet, China for three months. I lived in Tibet. Tibet is where the Dalai Lama lives and comes from. Tibet is the highest, darkest form of buddhism tibetan buddhism okay so i lived in tibet china for three months and that's where i learned how to have a prayer life okay i lived in tibet china for three months and uh, i remember i was hiking because i love hiking it's one of my favorite hobbies things to do i was hiking uh and uh, i was hiking and i was on top of these mountains and i was just worshiping the lord and the Lord spoke to me, and I, I've shared this many times, but I'll never forget this. As I was worshiping the Lord on these mountains in one of the most unreached places, one of the most unreached regions on earth. It's the highest mountains of, on earth, okay? And as I was worshiping the Lord, God spoke to me and said, Son, thank you for worshiping me here. You are the first person to ever acknowledge me and my name on this mountain. As long as this mountain has been created and has lived on planet Earth, you are the first person that has worshipped me on this mountain. Every other person worshiped Buddha. But you're the first person to worship me on this mountain. That's what I knew. It's a fight for territories. That's what I knew, that it is a fight for regions. Who am I talking to right now? Listen, you are a watchman. You're a watchwoman on the wall. If you were not a watchman, if you were not in your watchtower, if you were not in your war room, then what would happen to your neighborhood? What would happen to the block that you live in? What would happen to your neighbors? Listen, the reason why certain things are not happening, like doom and gloom and destruction and hellfire and brimstone, is because your prayer life is actually bringing preservation to your neighborhood. Your presence is bringing preservation to the net, uh, to your zip code. Your prayer life is bringing preservation to your region. And as I worshiped God in that time, Jesus met with me and said, you're the first person that loved on me, worshiped me on this mountaintop for thousands of years. Are you catching this? Are you, are you hearing this, people of God? And that broke my heart. 
And I understood that this was a fight for territory. How many places, how many square footage on earth is occupied by demonic presence? How many square footage in the Amazons, in the jungles of Africa, in the bush of Kenya? How many square footages are actually occupied by demons? Uh, let me share with you another story because I'm just getting stories after stories right now, personal stories. If you're enjoying the same end. I uh, I went I visited Samoa. Okay, if anybody knows me, I'm a I'm a beach bum. I love the beach. Okay, that's why I moved here to Newport Beach. All right, I left Koreatown, uh, crowded traffic out, uh, uh, Koreatown, and now I'm here in Newport Beach in Southern California, where Lonnie Frisbee, John Wimber, the Costa Mesa, uh, you know, uh, Calvary Chapel, where the Jesus People Movement was birthed. So I'm here in Newport Beach, but when I went to Samoa, there's these demons called the squatter demons. Okay, there's these uh, spirits called squatters. And uh, one of my friends, Apostle Cruz uh, West Westmoreland, he shared with me this story. He shared with me how in, in certain houses or neighborhoods, and that's why a lot of houses have gargoyles. That's why houses, uh, they have lanterns, or that's why they have uh, statues or idols, is to allegedly keep these devils away and keep these curses away. But we know that it actually attracts devils. Fire. Fire. Bam. Roboshka. So uh, my friend shares with me the story in Samoa on how uh, each house, you know, uh, each home, I mean, you know, uh, you walk in, right? You walk in through the gate, you walk in through the yard, and you come to the front door. Set. But he shared with me these stories of how these squatter demons would actually reside in, in a certain uh, sphere, out uh, in the home or outside the home. And so he shared with me the story how somebody uh, ignored it, you know, downplayed it, and as they walked on, uh, that that place, this squatter demon jumped on that person and that person lost their mind. So why am I sharing this? I wonder how much territory is occupied by demons. Yes, greater is he that lives in you than he who is in the world. However, when you are a house of prayer, when you are a person of prayer, then there's a Jacob's ladder that's over your life and angels ascend and descend. And when you are a prayer warrior, when you are a watchman, not a watchdog, when you are a watchman and you pray rather than bark and make noises like an annoying chihuahua like many people do, when you pray and when you sound the alarm, then that territory, that realm is occupied by the Holy Ghost, is occupied by the Holy Spirit, not by evil demonic principalities, not by occultic realms. That's why it's important for you and I to be house prayer. But this is incredible. I'm going to go back to this. I know I'm sharing stories. I'm preaching. Jesus says, my father's house will be called. A house of prayer. Oh my gosh. Matthew 21, 13. And Jesus said to them, it is written, my house, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. Not a house of miracles. I know the apostolic is important, but it doesn't say a house of the apostles. Then why do we have so many conferences on the apostolic? Then why do we have so many conferences on church growth? Okay. Uh, I understand that like, People think they've graduated prayer or people think that like prayer is not that important. Can we get to the more important things like like money, like businesses, like finding my identity, my true calling? Pastor Ben, can't you just teach me on how to cast out devils? No, because everything has to do with your prayer life. Everything has to do with the home, the place of abiding, the place of connectivity, the place of being one where you are one with God, the place of intimate relationship, Roboska, the place where his secrets are revealed, the place where his mysteries are manifested, the place where you make prayer for the nations. Man, I, I'm still in the beginning of this. Where you begin to pray the prayers of God for the nations, for the rest of the world. Remember this. If 
your prayer life is constantly consumed with what you want and what you need, that's not a prayer life. That's a wish list. If your prayer life is constantly you begging and pleading with God, bless me, Lord, what a wife. Bless me, God, what a husband. Bless me, God, what food am I? If, if that's what your prayer life is made up of, that is made up of dung, of caca, because you are meant to pray for the nations. You are meant to pray for the world. Your prayer, you, you are connected to God, not so that you can be praying for your own self, but when you pray for others, it will be fulfilled over you. Someone say amen. All right, come on. Someone say preach, Pastor Ben. This is so good because I want to go uh, into the Greek word of prayer right now. And uh, let me find this here first right now. Rabash, get it, get it. If you're receiving right now and or if you are with me right now, someone say amen. Hallelujah. 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 In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Listen, I want to talk to you about prayer. Shut up, but let me get a swig of my espresso. I'm gonna sing. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. And up from the ashes, hope will arise. Oh, death is defeated, and the king is alive. I'll raise a holly, hallelujah, holly, holly. I want to go over. I know I'm crying. So are you. All right. I want to go over to uh, the Greek word for prayer. All right. And I, well, as I studied this, I was so fascinated. I was so undone. This is so good. All right. Roboskaraba. The first time prayer is mentioned in the New Testament is this. My, my, my. I could just sing out to the Holy Ghost. The first time. Uh, oh, Scott, the first time prayer is mentioned in the New Testament is Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard it, it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who per pray, 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 pray for those who persecute you love your enemies pray for those who persecute you your prayer life is greater than the persecution when you pray pray for those who persecute you your enemies your enemies are under your prayers your enemies your enemies are under your prayer jesus says love your neighbors in no, excuse me no it says enemies even a car honk amen Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's the first time pray is written, mentioned in the New Testament. My gosh. Someone just slap your mama. Sorry if I'm so free, but this webinar is free. So the first time pray is mentioned in the New Testament is when Jesus prayed for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and send rain on the just and on the unjust. My gosh. Listen, this word uh, pray or prayer in the Greek is prosukome. I'm probably saying it wrong. All right. It is prosukome, which means it is an exchange. Jesus says, exchange your enemies with your enemies with the Father. Jesus says, exchange their persecution with blessings. Jesus is saying, pray for those who persecute you because I am about to exchange some things. Someone say amen. Someone say preach pastor. God is about to exchange some things through your prayer life. 
Your prayer life is a divine exchange with your emotions, with God's emotions, with your thoughts, with God's thoughts. Your, it is a divine exchange. It's a trade-off. It's a trading floor. Your prayer life is a divine exchange. Did you see that Ben Lim is, is, is gone off the TV here? Uh, your prayer life is a divine exchange where you're exchanging your muddiness, your murkiness. You're exchanging your mourning for joy. You're exchanging your sadness for gladness. You're exchanging your poverty for prosperity. You're ex Come on, someone say exchange. Come on, someone say our money exchange come on it is an exchange of your money of our money all right it, your prayer is an exchange so god is saying i'm about to exchange some things when you pray the first time prayer is mentioned in the new testament all right some say amen in the new testament is has to do with your enemies has to do with persecution isn't that incredible god is saying i love your enemies so much those people who persecute you i love them so much i want you to exchange them i want you to pray for them all right now someone say amen